Today, Dr. Christopher Kane will speak about dif different kinds of spine surgeries he has performed here at Hutchinson Regional, as well as shed some light on what makes minimally invasive surgeries unique. Dr. Kane is a graduate of Georgetown uh, School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and did his residency at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. He is certified with the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and is a member of the North American Spine Society. He has special interest in minimally invasive spine surgery and has been with Hutchinson Clinic since 2014. And I can tell you from my personal experience, he's a good person and a very good <coughs> surgeon. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kane. Hi everybody, um, good evening. Uh, um, I've been here, my wife and I have been here for about two and a half years and I can tell you that um, I have never been so welcomed in a community before. I love Hutchinson and uh, I'm just really, really happy here. I think this is an awesome place. Uh, great people, great thunderstorms. <laughs> <laughs> Where we live, we have lots of rain, but no thunderstorms. And I, we have this screened-in porch, and I get to sit in the screened-in porch in the middle of a thunderstorm, and it's just awesome. So, <laughs> tonight I'm going to talk about lumbar spine more than anything else. I do a lot of neck, but there's not enough room to talk about everything. So I'm going to emphasize lumbar spine. I'm going to talk a little bit about conservative treatment of low back pain, both acute low back pain and chronic low back pain. And then we're going to talk about some of the surgical options that we use to treat people with back problems. Understand that 98% of what I do is conservative care. Um, most people who come into my office are treated conservatively and with great results. I never am as happy as when someone comes in four weeks after I first saw them and said, man, I did that therapy jazz you talked about. I didn't believe it at all, and I feel like a million dollars. It's like, yes. you know. Um, so we do that a lot. So we'll talk about this whole thing. Um, let me s figure out this pointer. Help me figure out this pointer. The right area. That's the pointer? Oh, no, that's. Your, sorry, your laser pointer is the green. The green. Yep. Can you see the little green thing? OK, cool. There we have it. So, and I should mention that my uh, bride is here with us tonight. Um, she uh, is in charge of booking um, schools at the Cosmosphere, and so she's become a big part of the community as well. This place, how many places have a Cosmosphere, man? I mean, it's so awesome. And a salt mine. And the biggest grain elevator in the entire world. My brother came down here, and I thought he'd be all hep about the salt mine and all hep about the grain, you know. He's a builder, so he goes, I gotta see this building, man. It's so big. He says, holy Moses, it's really big. It's not as cool. All right, so we're gonna talk about acute low back pain first. So understand, acute low back pain is really, really common. In fact, it's the most common entity seen by primary care doctors. More than coughs, colds, fevers, whatever. My back hurts is the, is the reason that most people go to family practitioners. So 90% of humans on this planet have an episode of low back pain. Welcome to being biped and upright. Okay, and at any one time, it's been estimated 50% of us have back pain to some degree or another. Now, if you have acute low back pain, you have a 98% chance of this going away in six to 12 weeks if you do nothing at all. Uh, and so, um, the amount of treatment we give is very specific, and, and, and in fact, there's you know bajillions of dollars uh, spent on low back pain, and we found out that a lot of that's not necessary and we get you where you want to be without spending a lot of money going through a lot of pain and suffering. However, 2% of people with acute low back pain develop chronic low back pain, which is back pain that lasts more, for more than three months. Those 2% are worth 98% of the dollars spent on low back pain and the figure of $100 billion a year for spine problems in this country. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, is probably an underestimate. It's probably an underestimate. This your lady says, yeah, yeah but if, if your back hurts all the time, we're the best barometer in the neighborhood, so. 
And one of my jobs is to keep low back pain from becoming uh, chronic low back pain. So what do we do? You walk into my office, they said, Doc, my, my back started hurting last week. So if you're over 65, I won't get x-rays. It's not necessary, 90, you know, it's just not necessary. If you show up with back pain for the first time and you're under 65, you don't get x-rays. If you're over 65, I often get x-rays because of the danger of an osteoporotic compression fracture. Um, sometimes if you have trauma, you get them. If you're under 18 and have low back pain, you should probably get one set of films. And then there are red flags that we look for, night pain, fevers, chills, weight loss, uh, that indicate that this may be something more than just a sprained back or an acute back pain, and then we have to jump on that to make sure you don't have a tumor or an infection. So honestly, we start with Tylenol, muscle relaxers, rarely narcotics, and anti-inflammatories if you can tolerate them. I start with Tylenol first because it's, it's safer than, than anti-inflammatories. We give you a home exercise program. It's don't go home and rest. It's go home and get up and go. Rest is the worst thing you can do for acute low back pain for more than a little while. And there's been studies proving this. Keep working if you can work. And then if you're no better at six weeks, then we start talking about getting x-rays. Go to a formalized physical therapy program. And education about how to avoid recurrent co-back pain is, is really useful. We have little pamphlets and stuff we had out, just, you know, lift intelligently and all that. And most people do just fine. This doesn't cost a lot of money to do this stuff. I don't send everybody to therapy or get shots or, and, and, and certainly you go to narcotics because it's going to take care of itself the majority of the time. And how to avoid recurrent low back pain? Well, you lift properly. You know, lift with your brain, not with your back. It works better. Fitness and core strength are really important. And my big spiel is working out and working hard aren't the same thing. I hear, I hear guys that say, Doc, I work 10 hours a day every day of the week. Why do I need to go do exercise? Well, doing exercise to strengthen the muscles in a selective fashion is a much different thing altogether than just working your head off. And the idea of doing the exercise is to actually strengthen the muscles and maybe stretch out the muscles rather than overuse and abuse the muscles. And then smoking and nicotine elimination, I, I'll talk about that. And then obesity is a big deal. Um, I really love bogeys. <laughs> <laughs> it's 121 steps from where I live. It's bad. So I feel you. I get it. Um, I can't tell you how bad how smoking is for your back. Everything I do as an orthopedic surgeon is completely screwed up by smoking. I, I'm not trying to make a joke out of this. This is a big deal. I don't think many people in this audience smoke, but if I have to fight cigarettes, I will reliably lose. That's all there is to it. There have been umpteen bingillion studies, endless studies, showing very amazing data. One, smokers have more back pain and pain in general than non-smokers just because they smoke. <coughs> Radiographically, smokers have more disc degeneration. Smokers have a higher incidence of disc herniation. X-rays of smokers show much more degenerative changes. And incredibly, smokers who get surgery have much higher infection rates and much less possibility of the bones healing than non-smokers. If you operate on a smoker and do a fusion on them, and the fusion heals, their outcome is not as good as a person who doesn't smoke and whose fusion heals. So incredibly, it's not just the fact that the fusion doesn't take, it's the fact that they smoke. Smoking causes pain. And there's all kinds of neurotransmitters going on that I'm not nearly smart enough to understand, but it's a real thing. And how bad is it? Well, everything we do in smokers has worse outcome than non-smokers, and how bad is it? 300 to 500% worse. 
which is extraordinary. <laughs> so if you quit smoking, right? We're just talking about back pain. We're not talking about heart attacts and high blood pressure and oral fail and geo cancer and all that other stuff that you know we know about. If you quit smoking and you have chronic back pain, if you quit smoking and you have chronic back pain, in three to six months, there's a 40% chance that your back pain goes away if you don't do anything but quit smoking. I'm not making this stuff up. There's very clean data about this. People who quit smoking have a normal, enormously better surgical and, and uh, conservative outcomes than people who continue smoking. But if you smoke, my chances of doing much for you are pretty limited. If you need a fusion and you smoke, unless you're paralyzed, I'm not going to do it. And why? I don't want more complications than I need, and I don't want a lot of bad outcomes walking around. And, and you know, I understand smoking is a really bad addiction. It's more addicting than heroin. It's harder to kick than anything. I get it. But I also know that I just can't help it. Most of the time, I just can't. So did you get it about smoking? Okay, now, I want you to really pay close attention to the next slide. <laughs> Is there a problem? <laughs> Is there a problem with the truck? Or is there a problem with the, what the truck is carrying? What is the problem? Oh boy, is there a problem. <clears throat> Obesity is a big deal. I know this. <laughs> it's, a, it's the biggest single health ec epidemic in the country. It's probably a bigger health epidemic than smoking these days, believe it or not. And, it, and it's very, very important in the treatment of low back pain. So people who are morbidly obese, that is to say BMI is over 40, um, or, or 100 pounds overweight. Now you can be morbidly obese and not be 100 pounds overweight if you're 5'2". Um, have a much higher incidence of low back pain than people who are not obese. Now, those, that's, that is not as clean if your BMI is. Do you know what BMI is? Anybody know what that is? Body mass index. Good. It's just a measurement of how much weight you have for how much height you have. Now, it's not a great incident. If you're like the rock, the rock's body mass index is terrible, but it's all muscle. Um, but that's not true for most of us. But patients. And does weight loss help? Now, in, in the morbidly obese patients who've had bariatric surgery, successful bariatric surgery, and lost weight, those who had chronic low back pain before the bariatric surgery, if they got their BMIs under 35 and maintained that for a year, their back pain went away every time. That's an absolute statement. It went away every time. So does weight loss help? Oh, boy. Now, if you're, you know, six foot six and you're 20 pounds overweight, that's not a big deal. And then, of course, people with big BMIs in the operating room create big problems. There's bigger dead spaces to operate through, even with minimally invasive surgery. Their complication rate is bigger. And if you have a BMI over 40, um, I certainly will avoid doing open surgery on you at any cost. I'll try to do minimally invasive surgery on you. If you're paralyzed or have an increasing neurologic deficit, you know, it is what it is, but I guarantee you that the complication rate, the infection rate, and the outcomes are very, very hard to, to obtain. So I know it's hard to lose weight. It's interesting to note that carb loading creates the same end-stage neural receptors as heroin. So if you load carbs, you have this feeling of happy savvy, satiety that some people like, that triggers the same stuff that heroin does. So to say that oh, you know, carbs and food is addicting is true. It is addicting. And that's a big deal. And it's hard to just say, I'm not going to say go lose weight. You know, that's stupid. Everyone who comes to my office who's over has tried to lose weight. I know that. And I know it's really hard. 
But I also know that if your BMI is over 40, there's probably not much I'm going to be able to do for you long term. If I fix that truck that broke and you load it like that again, it's going to break again. And it's the same way with people who are really, really overweight. Uh, there are resources available, Overyears Anonymous, um, Weight Watchers, your primary care doctor, and it's almost impossible to do it alone. It's really, really a hard struggle. I'm aware of this. I take it very seriously. Um, but I do have to tell people that, you know, if you come into my office and your BMI is 45 and you smoke two packs a day, there's a lot of work you can do to get better. There's not much I can do to help you. And then, as a matter of interest, that we found out the best exercise for weight loss is weightlifting. Because you gain lean body mass, muscle mass, and by doing that, you increase your metabolic rate. And by doing that, you lose weight just hanging around. I had a kid that used to work for me who was Mr. Washington, one of these dudes. Um, and he was in the heavyweight division. He was just this muscular kid. And, you know, spent six hours a day in the gym. And I don't know if you know this, but every time these guys go to contests and pose, they have to cut, they have to lose. He has to lose 40 pounds every time. And when he cut, I, so this, this um, bodybuilding stuff is not healthy. It's not good for you. But, and, and he didn't juice. He was, no, that he was in contests where you were tested for substances, so you couldn't use anything, anabolic steroids, anything like that. But he did cut. And when he cut, he went down to 5,000 calories a day. And he was the most miserable human being I've ever seen in my life for about four weeks until he was ready to go. So this is a guy who goes down to 5,000 calories a day, and he, was, and he was just shedding weight. And you're going, well, who in this room eats 5,000 calories a day other than on Thanksgiving? <laughs> you know, that's hard to do, man. So he did about 10,000 calories a day. When I rode crew in college, I sat down in one of my classes and figured out how many calories I did, about 8,000 calories a day. I don't do that now. What I'm doing, I should do less. But the point is exercise, increase my body mass, causes you to lose weight better than long, slow aerobics and all this other stuff. So when I tell people to go to the gym, I really mean it. Oh, by the way, there's a study done on 90-year-olds, 90 and up. And they sent 90-year-olds, the study sent 90 and up to the gym for 12 months. I think there were 25 people in this study, 25 subjects. And um, number one, at the end of the year, none of them died, incredibly. And number two, with careful training, and they were trained under supervision, and they had to stick with it, and with careful diet, they all gained like 20% lean body mass. They all gained aerobic capacity. They all felt tons better on all the scales you use to see if you feel better. And uh, they all had much better activity levels, which proves that you can exercise, There's, you can exercise anytime. This is the picture of the first guy, believe it or not. It's the same guy. So. He lost weight, he quit smoking, he's a very healthy, happy guy. So what do you do with, so say you've done everything you're supposed to do and you know, you're still having back pain, back pain, back pain. It's been there for a long time. Now what do you do? Well, now you have to do a workup. You can't just say, it'll get better, it obviously hasn't. At this point, everyone with chronic back pain needs a set of films, for sure. Um, if you have red flags, red flags are you know, night pain, weight loss, all those other things, you for sure get MRIs. Uh, if you have neurogenic pain and nerve pain, we get MRIs to look for pinched nerves. If we can't get those, we get CT myelograms. We do stuff to look for pinched nerves if necessary. Uh, one, t one tool that we use very often is something called a SPECT scan, S-P-E-C-T scan, which is a scan where um, dye is injected into your vein the dye, radiographic dye goes to all your bones, and then it's, up, it's taken up by bones that are more metabolically active, i.e. bones that have been broken or sprained. 
And what we often see is, for instance, I, my back is sore, and it's sore right here, but you get a spec scan and one joint really lights up on the spec scan, or two joints really light up on the spec scan, you go, wow, those are, those are angry, those are metabolically active. We get a CAT scan or uh, make sure there's no fracture there, and then we can say that might be the pain generator, it might help lead us to further therapeutics. So I do that a lot, especially if there's a history of trauma. Uh, sometimes if you have chronic pain, we have to look for other than the uh, uh, anatomic or mechanical reasons. So you have to think about rheumatologic problems. You have to think about infections. Sometimes you have to think about cancer. And we look people up depending on what their situation is. And then it's very important to understand that people with chronic pain uh, develop psychosocial issues because they've been in chronic pain. And very often people in chronic pain have psychosocial issues that predated their pain and we try to gently investigate those when appropriate. Uh, so people with histories of depression, PTSD, childhood traumas, addiction histories are all prone to having chronic pain. <clears throat> I'll just give you one fact that's interesting, and this, I don't know how this applies to anyone in this audience, it's just a fact. If you look at the histories of people who have uh, uh, low back, degenerative low back pain that have gotten surgeries. And it, 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 let me rephrase that. If a person has low back pain and does not have obvious significant anatomic problems like severe instability or severe uh, nerve pain, but just have degenerative problems and they're being fused for degenerative problems, and they also have a premorbid history of physical abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, neglect, or alcoholic parents, their chances of improving with that surgery are less than 5%. And this has been studied in multiple centers. There's also a place in Texas called the Pride Institute, which does aggressive conservative care on people who have chronic back pain issues, most of them injured workers. And if those injured workers have the same history in their background, their chances of improving with conservative care are a lot worse. People who have the diagnosis of fibromyalgia have like 60% of those folks have that diagnosis in their background. So pain is not something that just comes from where it hurts. Pain comes from the brain, and you have to look at the brain too. It's very interesting that people with chronic pain have uh, MRI changes in their brain. You can actually do something called a three Tesla MRI, which is a really, really mega strong MRI. And you can uh, look and see that there's changes that occur in the brain as a result of chronic pain. So you have to, you, you can't just look at the back necessarily or look at whatever's hurting and say that's what we have to fix, they're going to be okay. I don't take care of backs, I take care of people with back problems or perceived back problems. And so I, you gotta take care of people who have all kinds of issues. And then of course the narcotics and the obesity and smoking. Um, so what's the first treatment for low back pain? Get off the couch, move it, get moving, get moving, get moving. Television does not cure low back pain. It's been found multiple times that that's the case. So, Honestly, I, I, people are afraid to get up and go. They think they're gonna hurt something. So you have to convince them that motion is not gonna be harmful. Once you've ruled out with appropriate workups, things that won't hurt them. You gotta, my job is to make sure that they don't have something that has to be fixed, and if they don't, then the first thing we do is get them moving. Um, and then of course the smoking and obesity counts just as much. Uh, physical treatment, uh, physical therapy for sure, if they haven't had it. It's incredible how many people I see have had three month, three years of low back pain, have had injections and pills and all this other stuff, and never once went to physical therapy. And for me, that's where you start. So we get them going. The physical therapy is not um, stretching for 10 minutes a day while you're watching Oprah. It's, it's really strong physical therapy, <coughs> emphasizing core strengthening, aerobic conditioning. It means that you work out. You know, and yes, you can work out even if you're hurt. We got to teach you how to do that. That was the therapist is for. Do that. 
And then non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, muscle relaxers. Um, if depression is a big deal, we make sure that their primary care doctor, mental health professional, gets them on antidepressants. If they're not, this is important. And then narcotics I don't use ever for chronic low back pain, for chronic non-specific low back pain. Now, if you have cancer and you're having low back pain because you have metastatic lesions in your back, of course I give you narcotics. If you have an infection in your back, I have one guy I'm treating now has an infection in his disc space, of course I give those folks necrotics. But both of those conditions will end. The cancer ends one way, and the infection is going to heal. If you broke your back and it hurts a lot, I might give you a short course of narcotics because that fracture is going to heal, right? You come in with a broken arm, I'm not going to say, here's some Tylenol, suck it up. I'll give you something that makes it hurt less. But this is not the same thing as people who have nonspecific low back pain from degenerative discs problems and, you know, can't necessarily be fixed. I don't believe in using narcotics in that population, and I'll tell you why. Because narcotics create pain. There's a very real entity called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and it means that because you, it's not hard to figure out. If you take narcotics, you get tolerant to the narcotics, almost always. Now, there are exceptions to all rules, right? Different people are different, but for the most part, if I take narcotic at level A for a, for a week, or two, or three, or four, it's not going to work as well at week six. So if I'm having the same amount of pain, I'm going to have to increase the amount of narcotics to get the same relief, right? And then increases, increases, increases. So we have people who start off with two Vicodin in a day, and a year and a half later, they're taking methadone, four tablets a day. And then they come in and say, my pain is 10 out of 10, and I'm taking all these narcotics. I hear it all the time. I hear it every day. So they're taking enough narcotics to you know, cause repository arrest of any other three people in the world, and their pain is 10 out of 10. It's worse than ever. Well, the amazing thing is, if you put those three persons through a multiple disciplinary pain program and get them off the narcotics, and this does not happen in two weeks, this happens in six months to a year to taper them. 40, 50 percent of people are completely pain free just by getting off the narcotics. This assumes that they don't have a fixable cause of their pain. But narcotics for nonspecific pain, I don't think are a good idea. I just don't believe in them. And then mental health issues have to be addressed where necessary. Um, as I said before, there's a lot of people who have developed uh, severe pain issues without an identifiable pain generator. I see people all the time with chronic pain, it's horrible. It's all in their back. They've had MRIs, spec scans, bone scans, plain films that are completely normal. And their pain is unbelievable. They're on raging doses of narcotics. I had one poor guy who um, had a fusion at L5S1 that didn't work. He had a fusion at L45 that didn't work. He had a fusion at L34 that didn't work. He was taking enough narcotics to actually kill me and my assistant easily. And I asked the guy, you know, the questions about physical abuse, sexual abuse, all that stuff. No one had ever asked him these questions. And as it turned out, he was born in the Menninger Clinic, which is a psychiatric hospital, to a mother who was actively schizophrenic and who'd work as a prostitute. <laughs> and that's what he grew up in. And he's not a bad guy, man. I mean, this is a good guy. He works, he does the best he can. But no one's asked him about this stuff. So he has substantial psychosocial issues that if you address them, may help him more than any other operation could, possibly. And it's not, and the psychiatric care that's used for this stuff is not, you know, how do you feel about your mother and what does this Rorschach test show us? It's very specific care. It's called awkward conditioning. And there's some other things that basically recalibrate how the brain interprets what it's sensing. It's not hoodoo, it's very practical, and it works. The problem is, is you can't get people to pay for it. Insurance companies will pay for narcotics, but they won't pay for mental health.
and I just find that really frustrating. They'll pay for epidurals three times a year, but they won't pay for psychiatric care, you know, and that's just something that we're, we're fighting all the time. I just think clinics are very aware of this. We have mental health providers now that help with these folks. So I have resources to send them to as, if needed. So I just don't say, well, you know, sorry. It's like, I can't help you as a surgeon, but here are the resources we have available for you. So we do have not just me. We have, you know, nutritionists. We have dietitians. We have mental health people. We have people um, who can do injections and so forth. We, it's not just me. You can't do this stuff by yourself. And I have a pretty good bunch of people that I get to work with. So let's talk about injections. You come into my office, you back hurts. Are there injections that are useful? Injection I use all the time is something called, um, oops, I gotta push the right button. There we go. So these little dimples, which I've always called the SI dimples, or the SI sulcus, when I was uh, preparing for this talk, I was found out they're called the dimples of Venus. Um, can be particularly painful on exam. So you have a person whose back hurts. I had four of them today, believe it or not. And you're examining their back and you poke right in this area. And sometimes you actually f see this little dimple thing and sometimes you feel this sort of soft spot in where this dimple is. And they go, what? That, I mean, they're like, shriek, that's my pain. That's where it hurts. And I give them a cortisone injection there. Now, sometimes I have to use, you know, if, if they're a little bit bigger, you need a longer needle sometimes, you know? <laughs> and when I do it, I can feel where the iliac crest is, which is the, you know, the hip bone, right? And what I do is to put the needle right in that, that area, straight in and then aim it up a little bit and I can feel it go right over the iliac crest barely and I put a cortisone injection there and I bet you 50% of people say wow it doesn't hurt anymore now not all those people come in at six weeks and say hallelujah you cured me and sometimes you have to repeat it and sometimes it only lasts a day and sometimes it doesn't do anything but I've just found it really, really useful. I, I went to a talk about SI pain, and all these really smart professor types were talking. And I stood up and asked a question, I do this, what the hell am I doing? What, what works? Why does this work? And all the people in the, in the panel, all these really smart professors look at one another going, I don't know, but we do it too, and it really works. <laughs> You know, and then a bunch of people from the audience came and says, I do that too, it really works. I don't know what it works, but it works. It is not the same as the SI joint, okay? It is not an SI injection. And we'll talk about that too. So one thing I use a lot, um, there's a particular guy in Wichita who actually talked here, Dr. Landers, who does facet injections for me. Now the facet joint is the joint in the back. Each vertebra is connected to the one above and below by discs in front and joints in back. And it's very, very hard for me to look at a person and say, oh yeah, your pain's coming from your disc, or oh yeah, your pain's coming from your joint. I can't do that most of the time. Um, but if we've done the usual conservative measures, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, blah, 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 and it, and it seems like it's joint-centered pain, I'll send him to Dr. Landers, and he will do medial branch uh, blocks, which are very specific blocks. There's a little nerve that comes right up along the joint at the side. And this anatomy was described uh, a long time ago. And what he will do is, is carefully inject numbing medicine where that nerve is. And he can't see the nerve, but he can see where the nerve should be under fluoroscope. So you have to do under in, in, in a fluoroscope suite under x-ray. And he numbs up the joints. And then right away, you get up and walk around. And if the person goes, wow, that's 50% better or more, that's a good response. And then he'll have you come back in a couple of weeks and do it over again. And it, this is just local anesthetic. This is, there's no steroids, it's just local. And if he does it again, and the second time they go, wow, that's terrific. I don't have that pain for a little while. That indicates that if numbing up the joint takes away the pain, then the joint might be the pain generator. 
And what do you do about that? Well, you can actually take a needle with a specific radio frequency current and very carefully place the needle around the joint where you know the nerves are and you buzz the joints with a radio frequency current and kill the nerves. These are just the nerves that, that go to the joint. They're not, they're not the nerves that go to your legs or your muscles. They're just sensory nerves. And that can offer substantial pain relief for up to a year. The nerves grow back. But in that year, ideally, you have time to really work hard on physical therapy and conditioning and weight loss and all the other things. And you'll be able to do it with a whole lot less pain. So very often, if you do that stuff, when the nerves grow back, you're not hurting as much. If they do grow back and you've done all these things and it hurts just as much, you can repeat that procedure. And when it works, it's a grand slam. It's terrific. It doesn't work every time, but none of this stuff works every time, okay? Epidural steroid injections. Um, epidural steroid injections mean you stick a needle in the spinal canal and put steroids around the nerves. That's what it means. And you, there's all kinds of ways you can do it, but in general, that's what it means. Now, I use epidural steroid injections all the time for nerve pain. I think they're very, very useful if you have a disc herniation and we can't get you better with usual medicines, they can really cool down the nerve with a ruptured disc. I'll occasionally use them in post-operative patients. You, you, you operate on someone and you move their nerve around and, and their nerve is really angry at you and they can't settle down with usual things. I'll use an epidural steroid injection perioperatively to settle things down. If you have spinal stenosis and either can't have surgery or you have spinal stenosis in just one little place, an epidural steroid injection can really make it feel better. You, you reduce the inflammation around the nerves, it makes it feel better. If you have, you know, arm pain from a disc herniation, it can be really terrific. Um, we use up to three of them. Uh, you use them one at a time. You never schedule three at once. You just do one and see how you do, and then do another if you need to, and another if you need to. If one doesn't work at all, you're done. Um, but if you have back or neck pain and no extremity pain, I don't think they're useful. I just hardly ever use them. I'll use them once in a blue moon if I can't think of anything else to do, but it certainly is not used very often. <clears throat> and then there's a the whole concept of sacroiliac injections. The sacroiliac joint is the joint between the pelvis and the sacrum, which is the lowest part of the spine. Before discs were described in 1945, Everyone thought, all doctors thought, that back pain was from disc, was from sacroiliac joints. And then the whole concept of disc herniations was discovered, and then back pain become from disc all the time. Well, a lot of people had disc surgery or degenerative um, surgery done and fusions, and their back pain was as bad as ever. And they're going, what the heck is going on? What, what, could, what else could be hurting? We fused the whole darn spine. So they look at the next joint below, which is the uh, um, joint that joins the base of the spine of the sacrum to the pelvis, the sacroiliac joint. And this may in fact be a pain generator that's very substantial. So if I think they have SI pain and, and there's certain physical exams and symptoms that would point to that, what you do is you do a, an SI injection. I do my own. Um, Take them to the operate, to a little operating suite with a fluoroscope and put a needle in the SI joint, put a little bit of dye in the SI joint, like this, and that proves I'm in the SI joint, right? You put the needle here, now is that in the SI joint? I'm not sure. You put a little tiny bit of dye in there and it outlines the SI joint, that's where I want to be. And then I put some numbing medicine there, maybe a little steroids. And then right away I get them up and walk them around. And if a person says, that's it. My pain is gone, man. And I do that twice, and I figure it's SI pain. Now, what do you do with that? Now that the pain is in the SI joint, does physical therapy help that? I don't know. Some of our therapists think so, and I'll try it. But most of these people have had buco therapy anyway. Um, that radiofrequency ablation thing I talked about that you use for joints, can you use it for the SI joint? There are some guys think you can, most pain guys think you can't, it's just too many nerves to buzz so it doesn't work reliably. So can you fuse the SI joint? In fact, you can fuse the SI joint. 
and it's not a big deal operation. Um, and I've done it a couple of times, and it's been a home run. I read guys who give papers that have done 473 SI fusions, and I'm going, man, where are all these people coming from, you know? So I may be under diagnosing that problem, but it, it, it can't be a problem that's fixable. Okay, so we have all this jazz. Who do you operate on? We talked about all this conservative stuff. What am I? I'm a surgeon. What am I? What do I do? Well, I do fix things. And spine surgery is to take pressure off the nerves. You can read this as well as I can. You stabilize unstable segments, and they're unstable from trauma, tumor, degenerative problems, post surgery. You correct painful progressive deformity. You cure infection. You treat neoplasms. I mean, what we operate on is not very many things. So you have to be very specific in your indications for surgery. And so who does benefit from surgery? Well, as far as I'm concerned, people who have disc herniation, spinal stenosis, cysts, or something else pressing on the nerve, masses in the back pressing on the nerves, can really get a lot of help. If you have low back pain, you have instability, tumors, infections, misalignment, significant deformity, surgery can help. I don't think surgery helps very often if you just have disc degeneration and your spine is otherwise, otherwise well aligned. Sometimes it does but not very often. The remarkable thing is the correlation between x-rays and back pain, other than in very few specific circumstances, is zero. So it's hard to tell from an x-ray and how much you know, worn out disc you have, worn out surgery is gonna help you. So you have to be very, very specific in the indications for surgery back pain and know that you have something that, if fused, if operated on, will eliminate a pain generator. So I got really interested in doing minimally invasive surgery about 10 years ago. It is not easy to do. Um, it, the learning curve is pretty steep, but it has great advantages. Um, by definition, it has smaller incisions, but that's not the whole deal. Having a smaller incision does not mean it's minimally invasive. The whole idea is you do less collateral damage to surrounding tissues, muscles, bone, joints, and so forth. Um, there should be less blood loss. It usually results in much less hospital stage and, or outpatient surgery. The outcomes may be better, and there's studies that are starting to show that. And possibly there are less complications, especially after you're through during the learning curve. When I started doing minimally invasive decompressive laminectomies, my dural tear rate was pretty high because it's a new technique and it's hard. And everyone who starts them has that problem. I'm, I'm kind of through the learning curve. Um, but, and so the dural rate, tear rate is not a big deal. But it does really get people out of the hospital and their post-operative recovery is usually enormously better. It's kind of amazing. So the traditional minimally invasive approach is this is the first thing that was done minimally invasive. You have a disc herniation. You want to take out that herniated material, take the pressure off the nerve, and instead of making a, you know, an incision this long, which is what we used to do, you make an incision that long, and instead of tearing the muscle off the bone and making a big hole, you spread the muscle down to the area where you need to go, nibble away a little bit of bone, move the nerve out of the way, and take out the disc. And instead of having blood loss and a big gash, you have a little tiny incision, and it's done as an outpatient 95% of the time. Blood loss is non-existent. And the outcomes are just as good or better because the collateral damage is not as, good, is not as bad. And there's been lots and lots of studies showing the, the efficacy of a micro-disc over a standard open laminectomy discectomy. To do microsurgery or minimally invasive surgery takes a lot of toys. It, the, and this hospital has been very, very gracious in getting hold of those things. You need an operating microscope for sure. You need special, ta special operating tables for sure. Throughout the course of the operation, because you have a little tiny aperture, you have to move the patient back and forth while they're asleep by tilting the table back and forth so you can see little tiny bits of where you're getting to. You have to have good fluoroscopes and good fluoroscopic technicians 
who can show you where you are, because the only way I know where I am is by the x-ray. So the x-ray is telling me where I am. I need really good x-ray people to help me with that. We have that. And then you need all kinds of special tools that allow you to get to the bottom of a very small hole and burr or nibble or remove without getting your hands in the way of the microscopic field. So that means all your tools have to be kind of L-shaped with your handle over here and the business end over here. And that's all expensive. You know, the, the first time I ever made rounds as a resident, I still remember this day. I can close my eyes and play the tape in my head making rounds at Barnes Hospital for the first time. And the first room we walked into was a room with three beds with three teenage girls. They were 15, 17, and 18. I even remember their ages, my goodness. And they were lying in beds in body casts, nipples to knees body casts, with a thing cut open for them to do their business. Their legs were in these casts, and there was bars connecting the knees. They had their backs fused at L5-S1. That was standard of care. They were in the hospital for three months in nipples and knees casts. Imagine rehabbing that little problem. For the same problem, number one, we don't have to operate on it very often, but for the same problem, I do an outpatient surgery through an incision that big, I can fix the slip rather than fuse it, and they go home that day. Same problem. That's what's happened in my relatively short lifetime in medicine and, and surgery. So it's really exciting the stuff we get to do for people and how much better it is than what it used to be. So let's go on. But you need a lot of toys, a lot of, and a lot of training because it's a lot harder to fix something through an incision this big than it is through an incision that big. And it's a lot harder to be, and you have to know the anatomy super duper well because all you're seeing is the very little bit of it. And the orientation is you have to know exactly what every little piece represents and you have to have an x-ray tech that makes you, you're in the right place. But the cool thing is even with a very big person, again, I don't like operating really big people, but with even a very big person, we can use a pretty long tube and go through a pretty big person we actually have extra long stuff with extra long burrs. And we can do it without talk, causing a lot of soft tissue damage with a lot of, without a lot of hurt, you know. It, it's, it's a big deal. So what's an example? So here is a 56-year-old obese white male with pain and weakness in the left leg. If you, if you look at this MRI, you guys aren't looking at MRI, so I'll tell you. This is the lateral MRI. This is looking at him from the side, okay? And if you look here, this white stuff does not belong there. That white stuff is a big cyst, which has come off of a joint. Here's the joint. Here's the cyst. This is the spinal canal. This cyst is, is taking up half the spinal canal. Half the spinal canal. I mean, it's huge. And this is not as thick as this fellow is. He's, he's pretty thick. He's about 12 centimeters thick, which is deep. But the poor guy was really miserable. He was having pain. He was getting developing weakness. The only option is to operate on him. So we did. And we used a minimally invasive approach using a tube retractor, not the one that we sewed you, but a tube retractor. He went home the same day. He had no blood loss. In about five months of exercise, his weakness is almost gone. He's doing his exercise really, really good now. And his exercise and his weakness is almost completely gone. And he had no pain the day left. Now I guarantee you, if I'd done that 12 years ago, he would have an incision this big. Because if you're big, the incision has to be longer. And it was done through an incision this big. That's what we get to do. It's pretty cool. Um, so we do disc herniations, but we also do other things that are more complex and involve even having to do fusions on people. So spondylolisthesis, or slippage of one bone on the other, and spinal stenosis, or pressure on the nerves, at the L4-5 level is one of the most common things that I take care of. It's probably half the operations I do 
involve spondees with stenosis. And the patient comes in with back pain and very significant leg pain. And the treatment is surgery most of the time. In this problem, you have to do two things. You have to not only take the pressure off the nerves, but you got to fuse the back. Now, when I started practice, that involved an incision this big. It involved scraping all the muscles off the bone, exposing all the bone, taking all the pressure off the nerves from the back, putting in screws and rods. Blood loss was at least three to 500 cc's. Transfusion rate was at least 20%. Hospital stay was at least five days. That was the best we could do. And in the population over 65, the complication rate for that operation was 25%. I don't care who you were. The complication rate was 25%. And the need to do the super adjacent level, the next level up, you fuse one level so you made it really stiff, so there's more wear and tear on the next moving level. The need to fuse that level was 20%, and that's the best we could do. Things have changed. So here's what I'm talking about. This, this is a very common problem we have. Here's a lady who comes in with a little bit of scoliosis, doesn't mean anything. But if you look at this part of the spine, if you draw the line down the back of the bones, they all line up until you get to here. And you see there's a slippage of one bone on the other there. That's called a spondylolisthesis. It's because the disc is worn out. And the four or five level is very, very common because the bottom vertebra is tied down to the sacrum with so many ligaments and stuff, it rarely slips. So the first big stress and strain is right here. So this is where the problem happens most of the time. This is something I see every day. Well, not every day, but I'd like to. But this is something we see a lot of. You know, and conservative treatments are anti-inflammatories and so forth and so on, but usually operate on them. The MRI, this is a normal level, okay? This is the, the, the vertebra. This is the dural sac. This is the cerebral spinal fluid. And each one of these little dots is a nerve. You're looking at the nerves end on. And you can see how they're just floating around in there. Nothing's touching them. That's how it should look. If you go to this patient, though, number one, if you look at the lateral, you remember that slip on the other view where they were standing up? It's not there now, is it? It's gone because they're lying down with the MRI. So I know that that slippage is moving backward and forward. When it lies down, it lines up okay. When they stand up, it goes forward. When do they have leg pain? When they stand. When does it go away? When they lie down. So they could lie down for the rest of their lives, but they don't want to do that, so they got to do something. If you look at the, the pressure, here's the pressure on the nerves. It looks a lot different than that first thing. This is how much room they do have, or they should have. This is how much room they do have at this level. And understand that when they're standing up, that room is much, 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 much less because of the slippage forward. So how do we fix that now? Well. Um, we have to take the pressure off the nerves and we have to fuse the spine because if you don't fuse the spine, the pressure will just go back again right away. It, it, you just got to do both. So how do I do that? Hmm. <laughs> and after I talk to my nurses, we, we do this. Um, so I do something called extreme lateral inner body fusion, x -lift. It's a whole new approach to this problem. So instead of going in the back and making a big incision, we go through the side. And we make a little tiny incision, literally this big. And then I make another little tiny incision behind it. And behind the posterior incision, I literally put my finger inside the abdominal cavity and push. Uh, the patient's lying on his side like this, asleep. <laughs> and we make an incision here and a little tiny incision behind it. The finger is put inside the abdominal cavity, and I push the abdominal contents out of the way. <clears throat> right? So now I have a, a space between the abdominal wall, the muscles in back, and the chitlins in front. There's a space there. It's called the retroperineal space. And then I pass a probe down through that retroperineal space to the disc involved. And then again, put a bunch of dilators through there. And then a retractor in there. And it kind of looks like this when you're all done. So here's the retractor in place. This is for orthopedic surgeons. The handles are labeled right and left. <laughs> but here's the retractor in place. 
The front of the retractor holds the muscle out of the way. The back of the retractor holds the muscle and nerve out of the way. And you get a great view of the disc. This is the bone above, bone below, and you look at the disc. This is all done in our x-ray view. So all you see is this little disc. You don't see anything else, right? It, there's nerves out of the way. So all these things have uh, electrical probes in them that tell you where your nerves are electrically, right? And then what you do is you take out the disc completely and you put where the disc used to be a piece of plastic. And what the piece of plastic does is spread the bones apart, spread the vertebrae apart. And in the piece of plastic are big holes that are packed with bone graft. So you spread the bones apart and then you have this piece of plastic in here and the bone graft touches the vertebra above, vertebra below and heals across there and the two bones over time becomes a single bone. That's what an exploit is. And uh, so that's what I talked about. You can do that procedure from L5, not the lowest level because the iliac crest is in the way, all the way up until the mid thoracic spine. If you have the thoracic spine, you go into the chest, you have to move the lung out of the way, you have to cut out little bits of rib to do it, but you can still do it. And through this approach, you can do just about anything. Certainly there's less blood loss. An excellent blood loss is about 15 cc's. Seriously, that's all. It, whoops, wrong way, wrong way, wrong way, right way. So that's a retractor we use, and, and the same retractor more or less is used from one end of the spine to the other. When you're in the chest, there's a blade that holds the lung out of the way, but it's the same idea. And it works really, really well. So it has downsides. Everything that's new and great has its own set of problems. So you can't do this in osteoporotic bone. So we check most of the time for osteoporosis. If the bone is softer than the cage, all you're going to do is to cave in the bone. So if the patient has severe osteoporosis, they may not be able to get this procedure done. Minor osteoporosis, yes, and we can change the osteoporosis in a short period of time, so it allows us to do this. The most common complications are thigh pain. When you go through that muscle, you can cause the thigh on the right side to hurt up to 10% of the time. It goes away in six, eight weeks. I've had three honest-to-goodness nerve palsies where the nerve just didn't work after surgery. It got better in six months every time. It always does. It's very disconcerting, and that's three out of about 300, so it's a 1% chance of a real nerve palsy. Um, subsidence means that the plastic thing subsides into the bone, and that's happened, um, and it doesn't cause any change in the outcome. I actually had a recent one where the bone broke and I had to take her back and do uh, screws to fix it, but she's doing okay. And of course, you're going through the abdomen, and whenever you go through the abdomen, there's all kinds of round things there that you don't want to hurt, and you can hurt any one of them. I haven't done that yet, um, but it can occur. So even with all this stuff, the complication rate in multiple studies is much, much less than a traditional open approach. Okay, so. And then the other thing we have to do is we back up that with screws. We put screws into the bone, and we can put the screws into the bone through a little tiny incision and with an x-ray machine and put the screw into the bone, avoiding the nerves, avoiding the spinal cord, threading a little piece of bone with the screw. And then when the screw's in place, we have a tower that sticks out of the screw initially, right? And then what you can do is to pass a rod through all these towers, through the screw heads, put a nut through the tower and attach the rod to the screw, tighten the whole thing down, and then the towers just come off and you end up with little tiny holes in the back of the spine without stripping any muscle and with solidly fixing the, the bone. It's really cool. There's a learning curve to this. <laughs> um, and we've gotten pretty good at it. So um, I, I mentioned that we slipped the rods to the bone. These rods are being put through the towers into the screw head um, this is the cage that we put in there, right? This is all done under little tiny incisions. And that's what we did for this lady. The first one we saw, we can see that this cage is in place right here. The wires are just plastic wires in the plastic cage and are there so you can see the cage under x-ray. It's the only reason they're there. This is where the bone graft is, and then these are the screws we put in. This particular cage happened to have uh, screws that go to tabs that are attached to the cage, and that they don't all do that. But this is all done, as I said, between with 
one little incision on the side this big, one little incision behind it, and four little incisions on the back. This lady, I'm pretty sure, um, went home the next day, and she's 76. Now, they don't all go home the next day, but it's not uncommon. The most important thing that's happened in spine surgery in the last two to five years since I've been here, been here is, the other, uh, is the understanding of sagittal alignment, and this is really important stuff. Remember this part. Forget about everything else. This is really important stuff. It is essential to have a good spine, to have your head over your tail when you're walking. When you stand up, you should have your skull over your sacrum. That's normal. Now everybody knows as you get older that changes a little bit. And that's acceptable to some degree. But if that's too far off, you're going to have back pain. Guaranteed. Now, we have a line called the sagittal vertical axis, which is the line that goes from the base of, this, of the neck on a standing lateral film and goes straight down with gravity and should land through the base of the sacrum, right? As that line goes forward, as the line from C7 driven straight down goes more and more forward, you are bent more and more forward, and you will have more and more pain. Now, we knew about this thing a long time ago. We knew that you should keep curvature down in your lumbar spine, because the only way you can do this is to have this thing curved forwards and this thing curved back. So the bottom of your spine should be curved. <coughs> And the top of your thoracic spine should be curved so that they line up in an S shape one over the other. That's how we're supposed to be. All right? We know that. But we've learned something the last two years that's infinitely more subtle than this. And I spent a lot of time fixing that. So the infinitely subtle thing is something called spinal vertebral parameter. You don't care about this. But there's a, this is, who came up with this stuff is a really smart guy smarter than I'll ever pretend to be. There's an angle. This is the lateral x-ray. This is just an x-ray of the back from the side, standing up. up an upright x-ray. That's all it is, okay? So on this x-ray, we have a machine that does this in the clinic. You just do it. You draw a line from the femoral heads to the middle of the sacrum, and they make a perpendicular from the middle of the sacrum out. That angle is called the pelvic incidence. Everyone's pelvic incidence is what they are, and it doesn't change. You're born with your pelvic incidence. It's just how your pelvis is attached to your lower back. That's how, you, that's how God made you, okay? Now, sometimes there are bigger and lesser pelvic incidences, but they're all around 60 to 70 degrees. If you have a pelvic incidence that's 90 degrees, you know you have an almost horizontal sacrum. People are built with that, and they have problems because of the way they're made, you know. But this is really important. There's another angle called lumbar dosis. It's the angle that's between the top of the L1 vertebra to the top of the sacrum, and that varies. And then there's something called the pelvic tilt, which basically is a measurement of how tilted your pelvis is back and forth. Now, this isn't, I don't want to make this too complicated. Right? If your lumbar, lord do your lumbar lordosis and your pelvic incidence should be pretty close to one another, within nine degrees. Really smart guys figure this out, not me. Really smart guys figure this out. Now, if your lumbar lordosis is a lot less than your pelvic incidence, that makes you lean forward. You will lean forward. Period. And to correct that, instead of walking like this, you try to fix that. And how do you fix that? What's the first thing you do? You try to till your pelvis to get upright. And you draw your pelvis back. And that's hard to do. That hurts if you do it all day long. Your muscles just give out. You have back pain. So you have this thing called the pelvic tilt that it should be less than 20, but if it, if it gets big, it means that your pelvis is too tilted and you're working way too hard and you're going to have pain, period. So 
here's a lady that came in after I learned about all this stuff, which is in the last couple of years. She's 71 years old. She has moderate leg pain. She's done physical therapy, steroid injections, all that jazz, and she is 100% miserable. She has terrible back pain. Now, I would look at this lady before this pelvic incident thing became known, and I said, well, look at her back. She's really worn out. She's got a worn out back. I can't do anything about that. And she has this little slip here, so maybe she has spinal stenosis. And if she has this slip, which is spinal stenosis, I should do a fusion on her. She also, has, she also has this scoliosis, but it's not that bad. But, you know, her back hurts. She's old. She said, eh. But now we've learned some more stuff. We got an MRI. Every single level has spinal stenosis. So she has leg pain because her nerves are pinched every level. Instead of having a nice open canal, there's pinching here, here, here. The whole thing is really pinched. So what do I do, man? Well, she has leg pain, so I know I gotta unpinch the spine, right? And I'll tell you, before this pelvic alignment became so well known, all I would have done was to take the pressure off the nerves at every level. I would have fused four and five. I would have quit. Her leg pain would have been better and her back pain would have been probably worse over time. But that's the best I knew how to do. That's all anybody did. But I said, well, let's look at this a little bit carefully. I don't know what to do with her, so let's get some more studies. So we got a scoliosis view. I get scoliosis views on everybody, and look what happens. Look where that line is. Remember that line's supposed to be back here? Her line is way forward. What does that mean? She's leaning forward. Here's your spine here, like this. If I draw a line from the base of her neck straight down, that line should line over here but it's way forward. That means she's leaning forward. That's wrong. And I know that that hurts. And then you look at her, she's got a fair amount of degenerative scoliosis. So, all right, but I still don't know exactly how to fix that. What do I do? I mean, where do I straighten her out? Where do I, where, what part of the spine do I work on to put her head over her tail? I don't know, except I do know now. This is where you get all these funky angles, all right? I measured pelvic innocence, it's, it's 52. I measured lumbar lordosis, it's 28. This and this are supposed to be equal. This is less than this. That means I gotta put more curvature in this lady's spine. I gotta make her back more curved. So her head is over her tail. I also have to take the pressure off the nerves. How do I do that? Well, at one time, we would have made a big incision in her stomach. We would have opened everything up, and we put little cages in front at every level. And then we would have had a big gash in her back and put in screws, probably to the top of her thoracic spine, because that's what we did. I did something different. I did two days of surgery on her, about two days apart. The first day, I did x lifts at L1 through L5. Two days later, I did percutaneous screws at every level, and then I did a fusion at the bottom of the spine through another minimally invasive approach. The goal of this operation was to straighten out her, to not straighten out her spine, to curve her spine, and to take the pressure off the nerves. Well, let me tell you something. If I just put a cage between these two bones and spread the bones apart a little bit, that unwrinkles the ligaments enough that you take the pressure off the nerves. So I can take the pressure off the nerves by doing this cage without even looking at the nerves. Do you follow me? If the two bones are together and I pull them apart, the ligaments that are attached to the bones go from being like this to like that, and there's no pressure on the nerves anymore. So what we did was this. We did these cages, oh my goodness, stop. We did these cages here, 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 all percutaneously. It took about an hour and a half. That was, that was part one of got x-rays. And we said, wow, look at what we did. we did. We really got a lot of curvature back here. And then part two, 
We put all these screws in, every one of these screws in to little tiny incisions, including the screws in the pelvis, to little tiny incisions. And then we put a little cage in down here to a little tiny incision. And then we connected all these screws on either side with the rod, connecting all these screws with the rod, starting up here through a little tiny incision and loop the rod all the way through these screws down to here and tied it in place. Now that used to be really, really hard, but now there's this cool thing called a bendini, where you put a little light probe in every screw, it goes to the computer, and it tells you how much to bend the rod. And you bend the rod, and it just goes in. Before, bending the rod to make this fit would have taken a day and a, I mean, for me, you know, really long time. Now I just use the bendini, and it's right every time. It's like, this is cool. Now, this lady went done two days after stage two. Home, not to a nursing home, home. And I saw her six months later, she's upright for the first time in forever. She's upright. She can't believe how upright she is. And she let me take this picture of her in the clinic the other day. These are her incisions. That's it. This incision covered um, four, five, and three, four. This incision went through the rib a little bit, so I had to do one, two, and two, three through the chest. I had to take out part of the rib to do that. But it was so all really mainly invasive. This incision where I did the fusion on, at L5S1, and these incisions were for the, sac the pelvic screws. All percutaneous, no blood loss, no transfusion, and she is absolutely 100% pain-free. And I go, I get to do this stuff. I get paid to do this stuff. This is cool. <laughs> That's what we get to do. And we do this here. We don't do this someplace else. It's done here. Thanks.